All right. Happy Friday, everybody. It is Meltano Demo Day on the 7th of May. So we've got an action-packed demo day today, and I'm going to go ahead and start by sharing my screen because um, we always start these things with a little bit of a slideshow. Not too much, though. Um, yeah, so for those not familiar with uh, Meltano, self-hosted, CLI-first, debuggable, extensible, composable way to run ELT for the data ops era. Um, what it says on the tin. On the call today, we have uh, myself, we've got Dow as the general manager and AJ. And the just a brief, um, uh, what we're gonna be covering today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the Meltano Hub and I'm very excited to, to discuss this today. Uh, we're gonna have Nick Hamlin um, do a little demo for us as well, some stuff he's been working on, um, not really related to, to Meltano, but that's uh, what demo day is for. We wanna hear from the community and just see what you're working on. Um, Derek's going to uh, briefly present some stuff about uh, Target uh, MS SQL and Meltano on Windows, and then AJ is going to detail the uh, latest S SDK release. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the Meltano Hub. Um, if you're on uh, the Slack channel, here we go. If you're on the Slack, uh, Slack group, you'll have seen the at channel announcement today doing the soft launch of the Meltano Hub, and this is it in, in all of its glory right now. So the, the goal of the, the Meltano Hub, and, and we have changed the name of a little bit to be more focused on Meltano and not just Singer. And we're doing that because we want the Meltano Hub to represent not just Singer, but all of the plugins that will be available within, within Meltano. So you know, we have all of our extractors and loaders. We expect, uh, we have DBT and we have Airflow for transformation and orchestration respectively. We expect to be adding more plugins um, and utilities as time goes on. And we've, we've got those on our roadmap. So Meltano Hub is gonna grow into this, this full platform for understanding everything that will work with Meltano. But we also want it to be a, a great um, experience for the, the Singer community and within the Singer ecosystem. So real quick, I'm just gonna go through the, the Meltano side of things before I jump into to Singer. So um, on the, the main page here, you'll see links to extractors, loaders, um, DBT is the transformer and Airflow is the orchestrator. The most interesting links are the extractors and loaders. This comes to kind of a nice overview page of all of the uh, extractors that are uh, discoverable within Meltano. And each of these are, this is, this is the same uh, markdown file that you're gonna see currently on the, the Meltano site. And we have plans to make this fully YAML backed and um, driven by um, a, a YAML file, not just a, a markdown file. And uh, like I said, yeah, we've got our our loaders here, and then these links right now will just take you to the, the traditional um, Meltano documentation. But of course we have plans to, to update those as well. So let's jump into the, the Singer stuff. So when you land on the homepage here, we've got a little section that says, you know, if you're here to learn more about the Singer ecosystem, check out uh, some of these resources. Um, but I'm gonna jump into the little button here, Hub for Singer. And this is a, a one pager kind of about our thinking on the, the, the Meltano Hub for Singer, our commitment to the community and detailing some of the work that we've done um, to support the Singer community. So we, um, one of the things that we've been doing to in preparation for this soft launch is taking all of the extractors and loaders that are available within Meltano, discoverable within Meltano and creating a clean version of their tap and target definition that has no reference to any external tool. And we do that um, because we want to support the ecosystem and we expect that, you know, Meltano won't be the only tool that, that will be able to use um, th these definitions. So I'll just kind of walk through the, the page here a little bit. So each, um, similar to, to what we saw for the extractors and loaders, each uh, tap and target is going to have its, its own page, but it's a little bit sim more simplified. Um, we do, you know, we have instructions on how to install it standalone um, with Meltano as well, where we link out. And then we have the, the tap specific um, settings that um, are specific to that tap um, and, and not tied in with the Meltano ecosystem. So we've removed all those environment variables and everything. The cool thing about this um, is, is kind of down here at the bottom. Um, each of these pages, as I mentioned, is driven by a YAML definition file. And um, this is kind of the first iteration of the, the spec for this. Um, but this each of these should be clean definitions of what's required to run the target, who maintains it, how to install it, what, it, what its capabilities are. And we are currently, um, we have a, a JSON schema defined, uh, one JSON schema for both taps and targets 
to validate the this structure. So currently this isn't um, a version schema, but I have tested it against all of the clean definitions. We're gonna, there's, you know, I need to update some of the descriptions on this stuff, um, but everything uh, checks out is validated currently. And you can get the, um, you can get the, the, the JSON schema always at this uh, URL, which is hub.meltano.com slash senior slash schema.json. Um, and then of course it's, it's in the uh, project repository as well. So we're listing the taps, we list the targets as you would expect. Um, we're also um, listing a, a full JSON object of all of the, the taps and targets um, together. And so our thinking with this is if you're building a, a product on top of, of Singer, um, we want the this uh, Meltano hub for Singer to be useful for you as well. And so you should always be able to, you should always expect to be able to come to these endpoints, pull the full JSON definition for all of the taps and targets and do whatever you need to. Um, for this first iteration, you know, no, nothing is is heavily versioned, um, but we're we're gonna have better uh, better versioning, um, and so we don't make any breaking changes uh, down the road. Um, but we wanted to to get these JSON objects kind of out there for for people to use and utilize. Um, so those are linked here. I link to the repository as well. We call out the the SDK for Singer Taps, which is already available. Um, link to the um, SDK for Singer targets that we're working on as well. And then you know, we went to the blog post. And then of course, we've got the good old, um, our interpretation of the, the Singer spec as well on the website. So this is gonna be the canonical place where it lives under slash Singer slash spec. And part of um, what I'm doing now, actually after this call will be to remove some of that from the main Meltano website and, and, and point you to the, the Meltano hub for Singer. Um, and then of course, you'll see at the top here, like. We, this is part of Meltano Hub, but we are trying to, to highlight that this is focused on Singer. This is the kind of Singer ecosystem space for all things related to, uh, oh, we should make that link back to the to this page. Um, so those are the, the big things. Uh, Dawa, am I missing anything from this main demo of the site? I think I covered uh, everything. No, I don't think so, but I was actually not paying a ton of attention because I am making the header sticky as we speak. So that it stays on the screen when you scroll down. Oh, very nice. We are uh, <laughs> reiterating on the demo while the demo is happening. It's yeah, that was uh, let me see if I if I do a hard refresh. Nope, not yet. Um, yeah, that was been been uh, cranking on this the past few days to make it look really good. Um, while I've been focused more on the the back end stuff. So, um, as I mentioned in the in the announcement post on Slack, this is a soft launch. Um, we have greater plans for the Meltano Hub generally, but also uh, specifically around the the taps and targets. And um, that's going to be all detailed within this this epic number number eighty three. If somebody can paste those links into the chat, that would be great. Um, my one thing I'll be doing this afternoon and, and continuing to iterate on is making the epic here um, much more easy to understand what's going on, the current state of development, what our future plans are. So right now we've got kind of the three main epics, as I would call them. So this iteration one is the the you know heavy focus on Singer. And a soft launch for today. The last thing uh, to do is, you know, announce it here. I'm updating some more documentation, and this this epic will be done. Our next iteration is still not going to be part of the the hard launch, but is really going to be focused on um, starting to drive Meltano from the the Singer um, tap clean Singer taps and, and everything that we've um, that we we've, we've set up. Because um, right now we we've kind of got a couple of sources of truth for for where. Um, tap target extractor loader definitions live. We want to unify those together um, to actually be driven from those clean singer definitions. Um, also part of this is synchronizing a lot of the work that we're doing within the singer, um, within the SDK for, for taps and targets. Um, and to make sure that um, the settings definitions that we're putting into these YAML files match what would be coming out of the, the SDK. So we're going to be looking to JSON schema to, to do that as well. And then our expectation is in late May, we're gonna do our, our hard launch. And this means we'll have a blog post with it. Uh, we'll announce in other Slack communities, we're gonna to post to, to Hacker News and Twitter and all that fun stuff. And that is gonna be focused around really pulling in all of the, and I, I kind of detail here what we're really expecting, like what are the, the features that we can have. The big thing is, is we are starting to use Meltano and AJ's done a, a lot of work on this so far uh, to, pull, to query GitHub and, and eventually GitLab to pull in every tap and target that exists out there and to 
bring them together on the hub so that they're easy to find. We want to pull in a lot of the metrics from GitHub and make those available on the, the Meltano hub. And um, yeah, and just, just creating good uh, versioning for the JSON schema, for the taps and targets themselves, um, and just really make this an, an actually valuable page beyond what already exists you know, that, that's discoverable within Meltano. So um, that's for the hard launch. And then of course we have even more plans to, to make it uh, more of a dynamic website. And you know, there's, a, there's a lot of things that we wanna do. For right now, we're focused on keeping this as a, a statically driven, statically generated site. So even the metrics that come in will most likely um, be generating a YAML file, which will interleave and kind of update on a, a regular basis. So um, these, are, these are some of our big plans. I'm gonna to continue to iterate on making these epics and issues a lot cleaner. And um, hopefully, uh, we'll be doing a bit of this more in, in public, so to speak. I'll be posting more on the Hub channel, which we just renamed from um, what it was previously. And yeah, we're looking for, for feedback um, and we want this to be for the community, um, specifically you know, the, the, the singer section, but we want the Meltano Hub to be useful as well. Um, we'll be uh, updating that as well. So that's my long spiel on Meltano Hub. Are there... Um, thoughts, questions, um, any initial feedback? Love it, hate it. Uh, how long until we can search for new tabs and targets? So I, I would say that would be part of the, the feature set for the, the hard launch later this month. Um, AJ is, is working on pulling a lot of the, the data from GitHub. We're gonna have kind of a, a cleanup and standardization process for each of those that, that we find. And yeah, so I would, I would expect by our, our hard launch end of the month. Looks great, and, thanks. And that's part, of, that's part of what I'll demo later in the session is actually the, the progress towards scraping that data from GitHub. Using, using Meltano and then we're using, probably gonna be using. In, yeah, using Meltano and an SDK based tap that I built last night. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll probably, it sounds like we were thinking about using DBT to, to do some of the, the cleaning and transformations and to set it up in a way that we can um, you know, import it into the, into the repository, or at least call it from the repository at build time. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say, cause I haven't been involved on the side. You guys, Taylor and Dalla, you guys have been working on this, this site launch really hard and I love it. Like I'm so excited about it because, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's always hard to, to, to tell like which taps you can trust, which taps are, are valid. And within the Meltano space, we have a small number of them that we like, hey, thumbs up, use these for Meltano. But like the community doesn't have that um, so much, except, you know, the, I guess the singer.io page, but that's always confusing. There's very little documentation. Um, so I'm really excited to see this uh, coming through. Hopefully it's helpful to y'all as well in the community. Great. All right. Well, that's all I have for the, the Meltano hub, unless um, somebody wants to revisit that later. But next up on the schedule, um, we talked to Nick and Nick has uh, offered to, to demo some of the, the work that he's been doing. Um, so Nick, I'll kick it over to you if you wanna share your screen or you know present however you want. Yeah, sure, thanks Taylor. And thanks everyone for letting me crash the party today. Uh, for those I haven't met, I'm Nick Hamlin. I, I lead the data work at Global Giving, which is a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits get access to whatever it is they need to serve their communities better, whether that's money, information, ideas, networks, corporate partnerships, we, we do it all, uh, disaster relief, a uh, little bit of everything. And so we are currently in the process of overhauling our, our core data stack to kind of the modern ELT paradigm that most people on this call likely are familiar with. Uh, and so Meltano doing extracting and loading, DBT doing transformations, uh, and then our uh, kind of end user facing BI analysis tool we use Metabase. And so uh, I, I wanted to just show, uh, uh, let me share my screen here while I'm firing this up, uh, something that we've been working on recently that was maybe, it, it would not shock me if everyone's like, yeah, that's old news. Uh, this was news to me, and I think it's something that we're going to get a lot of mileage out of. Uh, and so if it's, uh, if it's helpful, uh, that, that would be very cool. So what we're looking at here, this is, I'm in DBT. This is the automatically generated dependency graph of stuff in DBT that likely many of you have seen. Uh, the green stuff here is data that are pulled in from Meltano. And then I've got a various models and transforms and staging tables and things. Um, and so one of the big value prop 
pieces of, of this feature in dbt is being able to say okay here's my user table let me track all of my dependencies that go into that user table so that if i have uh, you know a test failure in this particular staging layer i know all of the things downstream that could be affected by that and then i can kind of de-risk and compartmentalize where my exposure my, where my exposure is and that's cool uh from you know within the data universe but where that doesn't where that still leaves problems unsolved is for stuff that people actually use outside of the data team so if i have an error in in this particular staging layer and that affects the user table and the user table is pulled in by uh, a kpi dashboard that the ceo uses to report to the board uh that's a thing i want to know uh and be able to kind of track that as algorithmically as I can track dependencies within the data stack. And so fortunately for us, DBT has recently released this feature that lets you do that um, and toggle over to DBT land here. Uh, and so in my uh, models folder, I now have this uh, thing called exposures. And exposures is, is the YAML file, just like every other model in DBT where you can e explain what things are. Uh, the only real difference here is that this is these are not tables these are whatever i want them to be and so i can by maintaining this yaml file keep track of that dashboard keep track of that ml model keep track of that particular analysis even if it's a really high value one uh, and so that's cool on its own uh, the problem with that in a vacuum is that this becomes really hard to maintain uh, and so what we did was uh, like I said, our front end kind of BI tool is, is Metabase here. And so the proof of concept, this is not fully automated yet, but the, all of the pieces are, are connected up where we can go into the meta database for Metabase, run a query to pull out the key resources that exist in there, run that through a Python script, then to automatically generate this YAML file and stick it back in dbt, and then we can do a dbt run. And so the end result of that is, uh, if I zoom out here a little bit, all of these orange blocks, and these are, if I zoom in, you can see, you know, here's, here's my user dashboard, here's some questions. Um, one thing you can't do yet is have exposures depend on other exposures. There's only one level of dependency uh, within dbt. They're on the fence about whether or not they're going to add that. But e even with just this layer, probably we, we will certainly not ingest everything we'll, or, because otherwise it would just be overwhelming with thousands of question dashboards and things. But to have the really critical ones represented in the DAG as dependencies so that I can say, oh, we've got a board meeting coming up. Let me rerun the tests just for my one dashboard that I know needs to be right uh, to do that asynchronously and to have stuff kind of monitored uh, through the regular orchestration is going to be really valuable. And so the one thing that I've not yet done, but I'm looking forward to doing is once I, DAO has been very generous in helping me debug our uh, Airflow uh, Meltano orchestration. But once I've got that up and running, I want to plug this into it so that as a step in the Airflow process, as a step in the Airflow process, we can have the expo automatically generated and updated, tested um, alongside all the data. So being able to add actual business products to a, a data-centric DAG, uh, that's uh, that's where we're headed. And I'm, I'm optimistic about the direction that it's going in. So that's all I got. Uh, happy to answer questions, but uh, also happy to turn it back to you, Taylor. Uh, I just want to jump in and say, Nick, thanks for sharing this. I love this feature. I was really excited when I saw DBT launch it a while back. I shared some links in the chat on the documentation for exposure. And then also there's a discussion on future art. One of those discussions is should uh, exposures be able to, do, to, to depend on exposures? Uh, but I'd love yeah. to see what, you, what you're doing here. Uh, it's, it's, it's great work. Do you have any Thanks. plans? Do you have like a, a CI process around reviewing DBT changes that touch the exposures? Is that kind of part of your plan? So, so to give context, like one of the things we were doing when I was on the data team at GitLab is we weren't using exposures because I think the version we were on it wasn't ready yet, but we would, um, we were using SciSense for cloud data teams or Periscope is what it used to be called. And basically when DBT would run, it would look at the models that was, was being changed and highlight like, hey, go you know double check these, these dashboards. Um, do you have any sort of like CI process around that yet? Or how are you thinking about that? Yeah, that is a th that is definitely a thing that is on our radar, but is not a thing that is in the immediate uh, set of tasks to achieve. I think we're, we're not quite ready to plug that in yet. When we get to that point, 
uh, kind of with the core data stack set up and running, uh, definitely that'll be something of that nature will be coming at some point. Yeah. Cool stuff. Awesome. Well, th thank you so much for, for sharing. Derek, did you have something you want to say? Yeah, it's awesome, Nick. And to say like to say that everyone knows about that, I don't think so. I mean, I've talked to a lot of teams, and most people do not do that. That's epic. Um, I'm gonna sh yeah. I don't know, I'm gonna show that picture to a lot of people. That's really cool. Oh, th thanks. That, that, that's nice of you to say. It's one of those things that like seems really self evident once you connect all the pieces together, and every individual piece is pretty straightforward. Um, but I'm hopeful that we're gonna be able to get a lot of mileage out of it. Uh, and I'll, you know, happy to field the follow-up questions async via Slack if if they come up. Perfect. Um, Thank I, you. I just want to uh, plug also. We have similar. We have a project right now to, or there's a, a member of the community, who's Andrew Stewart, who's working on um, auto-generating source.yaml files for DBT based on your extract um, load pipeline. Um, we absolutely should log if we don't have one already and issue to automatically register exposures if Meltana knows about them. Um, what what DBT calls exposures. Um, that we might be a little bit early on uh, the product life cycle to actually build it. But if, if anybody has time and interest to help us build that out, it'd be great. That's part of our vision with Meltano is just really understand and, and, and support the entire end-to-end -end flow. So, Yeah, that, there's, it's interesting. I, I think exposures could be really useful around the, the data publish or reverse ETL use case as well. So if you're using DBT to define the final table, and it, like this is what you know, Census and High Touch, I think, even integrate with DBT, and so you can like, it's it's just the DBT model um, is that defined in exposures, and then like we on the Meltano side would want to think about like how do we represent that in Meltano as well, because that is an extract and load job. How is it tied to exposures? I think there's some really cool things that we could do there to offer um, kind of validation across the, the end to end um, lifecycle there. So this is cool stuff. Awesome. Nick, did you have something you want to say? I'll unmute. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, that we have had that same idea. We've historically not crossed the bridge of reverse ETL, but the way the winds are blowing, I expect we will need to do that at some point in the next couple of years. And yeah. so part of the rationale for it was if we can, if we can map dependencies to something relatively static and relatively simple, whenever we do get to that point, uh, that's going to be really valuable to be able to build on that. So yeah, yeah. plus one to reverse ETL is a, it's, it's so interesting because it, it creates a cyclic DAG situation suddenly. Um, and how do you, like, I don't think DBT doesn't, DBT doesn't want to handle that, I'm sure. So how do you start defining, like, DAGs? Like, one one push of the cycle is the DAG in itself, but not a, a full cycle, not a, not a DCG, direct cyclic graph, I guess. Yeah, I mean, today, how do you handle that? You hire a bunch of people. I mean, it's yeah. a huge gain, huge gain if you can do this. Anyway, that's my so it's part of the reason we haven't done awesome. it yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Um, well, Derek, I think uh, I think you're up next. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. So, uh, do we want do you want this to be five minutes, or do you want me to do like a little live coding with uh, melt like initiate a new Meltano repo and show that how that works? What do you? Oh, we got about? time. Dude, okay. Do it live. Right, we'll, we'll do it that way. We'll do it live. Why not? So uh, let's share the screen. So let's go. I have a... screen too. Sorry. To be follow like uh, your live coding as well to see. Yeah, things. yeah, yeah. Well, in live coding, I'm I'm kind of faking that a little bit. So I'll be um, I, we'll we'll see. I, I'll do a Meltano repo though. We'll start from scratch and all then right. we'll see if I can make it work. Um, so and then you guys can all uh, poke fun, make fun of everything I'm doing. And it's gonna be on Windows too to make it even better. So now we're gonna we're gonna clip this and put it on the website. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna look like a complete idiot. Kudos we'll, to we'll... you for trying to do live code, man. I'm, I'm just very... <laughs> I have a backup, so just in case, we'll see how it goes. Uh, <laughs> so demo day. Um, I'll, I'll try a little. Uh, I'll keep this this part real short. So who am I? I'm gonna go over who who I am. The demo. Uh, we're gonna go. I'm gonna spin up a little MS SQL container. Um, we're gonna do Meltano native Windows. Um, so basically, I've made Meltano work in natively in Windows. It's like an ELT function kind of that works natively. And then we're gonna go over my target MS SQL, and I'm gonna touch on some auto IDM services we offer. So if you need help with uh, taps and targets, let me know. And we're gonna go over some issues I've been working through on the side as well. So who am I? I'm Derek Fish. This is my wife. Um, we have an awesome dog, Tank. Uh, 
who's auto IDM, autoidm.com, check us out. Uh, we want to bring data automation to everyone, even the small IT shops that don't um, know how to do that today and are a little scared of it. So that's the goal. Uh, we're just launching our new consulting tasks and targets. If you need help, let me know and I will help you write one. Um, so code time, let's, let's do it. So I had a repo set up. Let's make a new one. Um, Right now I have Meltano set up as a, um, I have it globally set up, so I, I'm not using a virtual environment, so we'll just roll with it. Um, this isn't the best way, but it works. So Meltano net will do demo day uh, two, why not? All right, here we go. Uh, demo day two, and then what do we want to do? Let's pull data from a CSV. So let's go, what is it? Meltano add tap CSV, I believe. Looks like we forgot extractor. So you guys are going to watch me screw up everything. Um, we got that. And then we're going to have to add my target MS SQL, which I'm going to pull up. Here's the repo for that. Let's go back. Um, so while this is loading, uh, you guys should all move to, if you're using Windows, PowerShell, their latest uh, PowerShell core is pretty good. It works with UTF-8. There's also Windows Terminal, which is pretty good as well. Um, let's add this, Meltano. What's the custom plugin thing? I forget the command. Um, I always mess this up. We need to add, what am I going to do? Uh, Meltano custom plugin. I think you want Meltano add dash dash custom extractor. Yeah, that's right. I always forget, so I go here every time, and you're dead on. Yeah. And it's loader, so oh, loader, right? We'll do that. So let's do this Meltano add custom loader. Um, we'll call it target MS SQL. And then it should run us through these prompts. Target MS equals correct for the namespace. The URL is going to be uh, this repo. Um, executable is actually target MS SQL, not auto IDM dash. Uh, I'm going to skip the settings for now. Uh, that should do what we want. And then we'll have to do the config on the fly too, which will be fun. So. While that's spinning up, let's hop over to Ubuntu. Um, so this is in um, WSL. And I've got a little script here called that uses Podman to just spin up an MS SQL server. I, and this SA password I'm not using anywhere, so it's fine for you guys to see it. Um, so you guys know like SQL and Oracle are both um, doing pretty good things with Docker. Um, and so you can spin up these containers really quickly and easily. Um, so I'll just run the script and it's going to spin up a little Podman instance. It's just same as Docker, same commands. Um, and we should have a SQL server up now. So I connected this before. This connection should break, hopefully. Looks like we're lagging. Let me just close this. Oh, of course, this thing's dead. Um, Let's try it again. Okay, while well, we're letting SQL manage, oh, maybe it is going to open soon enough. Cool. Let's copy the SA password. Um, should be able to hop in, hopefully. Maybe. We'll close this guy. Come on. I'm guessing I copied like a space or something. It could also still be spinning up the container. So I'm going to go back to our Meltano code and give it a few minutes. Um, so let's take a look at our Meltano YAML that's created so far. We've got a tap CSV and a target SQL. Um, for the tap CSV, we've got to create a file. So what do we want to do? Here's what I do. Um, I go back to the Meltano page, look at the uh, CSV right up. And then it's like, OK, well, we need files. So this config looks about right. Let's use that. You should check that out on the hub now. <laughs> oh, yes, I should. You're right. I'll uh, I'll do that for the next run through. 
Uh, I've got to set the little paste thing because Windows isn't friendly. And I am using Vim, so this probably makes it even harder for you guys. I'm sorry. Um, uh, two spaces entity. We'll call it thing. Sounds good to me. Uh, what do you guys want to do? How about music? What kind of music do you guys like? I like uh, rock. I'm a huge rock, rock fan. Okay, Rush. All right, we'll we'll do Rush. Any any other? Go here. Uh, ID. We'll do artist name, and then we'll do a rating. So for the first one, we'll do Rush. And are you gonna give it a nine out of ten or a ten out of ten? That's, that's a ten for me, man. Ten. Okay, I definitely have to put Led Zeppelin in here. So that's a All ten right. from me. Anyone else? We got another song choice that we want. Come on, Nick. Nothing. I, I had to find like a mute button. I give Rick Astley a solid five. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Can I get I some Food Fighters room. in there? Also with a oh, ten. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Let's do Food Fighters. Uh, that's definitely a ten. And then I think we have to throw like Bieber in here for a zero or negative <laughs> ten. I don't know. Um. So <laughs> let's uh up here and then. We'll see what I screwed up so far. And then loaders, we need to add config here. Like, I don't have these memorized. Um, I think it's this. So we're just going to guess through it. And then we'll work through the errors. Um, username, uh, password, uh, port, database. We'll call it ABC ports 1433 by default users SA. I think the host, I don't have it memorized. Let's see if this thing's going to work yet. Still not working. So our container's not up. Let's go debug that. Um, the container stopped on me. That's interesting. So it's running again. Hopefully it'll come back up. This is not being friendly, is it? Login failed. It's a better error, actually. Um, we need the password again. I'm jumpy. Uh, hopefully, you guys are following. Oh, we're in. Look at that. Got the database up. Cool. So next is we'll uh, add a ABC database. Cool. All right. Next. Let's see if I screwed anything up on the, oh, I'm in the wrong spot. All right, host 192.168, was it 170, I think? Yeah, okay. Um, let's, to test things, you'd like to do a little invoke on the tab CSV. It looks like we pulled data, that's good. Um, if we invoke the target, it should just do nothing. It should attempt a connection. It failed because the password isn't there. So let's take a look at the password. I didn't put a password in. Whoops. Um, let's copy it. Is there an extra space there? I can't tell. Let's see if this works. Looks like we're good, because it's waiting on input. So now we're going to hop into the other magic, which is this uh, little standard in to standard out kind of hack. Um, I could go through the code if you guys want it, but let's just jump to the fun part, which is here. So we're running Meltano invoke tap CSV, and then we're going to pipe that data into Meltano invoke target MS SQL. It changes the working directory to demo day, but I think we did demo day two. I'm forgetting. Yeah, and can you briefly explain why you're having to do it this way instead of going through yeah. the content itself? Yeah, so actually, let's let's do it. Um, so in Windows natively, um, ELT just doesn't work because of problems. And we'll go over them after I run this uh, target in a SQL. So ELT, um, that command will pull it it tries to pipe data from your tap into your target. The issue in Windows is that 
as you can see here, we've got a com create IO completion port problem, which ends up being, if, if you dive into it, it ends up being basically that somewhere in the Meltano code, I believe we're pointing standard outs output directly to standard in of the next process, but I don't exactly know where that's at. I know Dawa found it and I didn't dive into it yet. So there's something weird going on there. This works in Linux, doesn't work in Windows. So that's why I kind of redid it um, this other way. So this doesn't work. Um, and then that's why I did this for a little workaround. And let's uh, save this and give it a shot. Oops, should probably run Python first. So you guys get to see everything that I screw up. It's great. OK, I think we have data flowing. So let's see. And I don't have anything. So what happened? Where is my table? Oh, there it is. It is there. Look at that. Boom. We got it working. Woo so we got Let's Upload Rush, Rick Ashley. Woo so there's the demo. Does anyone have any questions or anything you guys want to run over? We did a little live coding, get to see how I struggle through Meltano and Python and all that junk. So not junk. Yeah, question great. for me. When is yeah. uh, target MS SQL going to be on the hub? Oh, that's a great question. Um, when, when it's not full of uh, to-dos all over it, um, I think, honestly, um, I'll add it to the hub. I'm working with a client right now. Uh, actually, it's a school district with like 25,000 of students, and we're going to use it. So um, we're going to have to add batching and a few other things. So I would guess um, in the latest, it'll be a month, um, probably more like two weeks. Um, that I'll have it ready to add to the hub. So maybe a month for the hub. That's be my goal. So June seventh. Cool. I'll even write it. I'm, I'm thinking we might want to have a way of marking a, a tepper target as kind of like experimental or or beta quality, just so that people Incubating. can find it if they have the same need, uh, instead of just ending up doing the same work over again if they think none exists at all. But we can talk about that uh, async. But either way, great to hear that we'll have an officially supported target MS SQL in about a month from now. Yeah. Great work, Derek. We should, uh, and we should push that too. I don't think uh, other people are doing that yet. So I don't know. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that'd be great. And I, I think we could, you know, clearly define, we have maintenance status on the, the YAML definitions for a, a tap and target. And I think we can have um, development status, uh, et cetera. So yeah, that'll be great. Well, Derek, go ahead. Yeah, um, I only had one more thing, which is we're also working through that Mel Turbo problem kind of right now, that issue that's in there called Mel Turbo. I, I like the name. But yeah, so we're, we're going to have to pull like 200 to 400 some tables, and uh, we need to prioritize it properly. So that's kind of our next thing we're going to have to go tackle. Um, so I don't know how much you guys are looking into it, but that's something I'll be into in the next couple weeks. So. Um, I have a question um, yeah. regarding like, like, it might be like a bigger Miltana question, actually. So, you know, like how um, you put the password on plain text on the YAML file and yeah. on, um, you know, on the, on the DBT side, you can use the uh, not liquid, uh, Jenja template, right? And it, it can read it from the, the environment variable. Um, like, is there something similar to that that we could do in Miltana or maybe even safer option if we were to like put this on like a server or something? Yeah, there is. We could show it if you guys don't yeah, have no, more time. Uh, I don't know if you guys have already guys covered it. We have some more things to demo, right? Yeah, so okay. maybe not show it. But it. Uh, yeah, for Meltano, you can configure any setting using an environment variable as well that you can either set in the .env file or actually in the environment in the shell where you're uh, running Meltano ELT. And what you can also do is reference environment variables from Meltano.yaml um, in the value for, you know, the inside the config uh, dictionary using the dollar sign of everything. Okay. They're just linked to the relevant docs. Yeah, so if no, you have more I questions about that, Parash, uh, I'll be glad to okay. help you out over Slack. Okay, sounds good. And, and one more thing I'll add, if as you're creating taps, if you specify one of your configuration settings as a password type, 
um, then Meltano will automatically hide that in the appropriate place as it's being set by the user. Okay, that was going to be the next question. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't necessarily that. prohibit somebody from manually editing the YAML file, but uh, if set normal set in normal Meltano-ish ways, uh, it'll automatically go in the correct way, uh, place. Yeah. Okay. Because I think one of the things we were doing was just like putting it on like config.ini and then using like um, like bit64 encoding to just like scramble it a little bit, but that's still not secure enough to like put it out on different systems. Right. Yeah, we there, there are lots of options as Dow would All mention. Right. I'll follow the document. Cool. Thanks. Great. Awesome. Well, AJ, you are up now to, to demo the latest release of the SDK. Awesome. Okay, let me uh, share my screen. So uh, because of the the time, um, I'm actually not going to rebuild this all from scratch, but I'm going to walk you through the process that I went through. Literally, um, <laughs> it took about an hour and 15 minutes to get it this far. So it's maybe maybe actually a little less. I think it's closer to 45, but I'm, I'm kind of um, including a little bit of the prep work I did ahead of time. But uh, let me start with a fresh... Um, a fresh terminal here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the process of creating um, a new tap with the uh, with the SDK. Um, I'm just using the terminal in VS Code here. Um, actually, let's let's just open up a new terminal. Um, CD source. Okay, so we just have a fresh terminal here. Uh, I'm going to go to the website and find. Um, the um, the cookie cutter um, sorry lots of browsers windows open so the cookie cutter uh, here's the SDK um, right now this is uh, in the repo itself but we'll be launching SDK.meltano to speed to speed this up um, but if you just navigate through the readmes you'll see there's a cookie cutter copy paste you can just paste in any terminal. Um, if you have cookie cutter installed, this will just work. If you don't, then here's the steps to install cookie cutter. Uh, so I'm just going to run this. It's going to prompt me that I've done this before. So I'll re-download just to get the latest template. Um, source name, I want to actually uh, pull data from GitHub. So I'm going to say GitHub is my source. So put my name in here. So if I publish this, um, it, it can register me as the author. And then it's gonna auto um, create a name for me. I'm happy with that name. Auto create a library name. I'm happy with that name also. Uh, now I select what kind of stream I'm working with, REST, GraphQL, or other. I'm gonna say this is a REST stream. I've done a little bit of my homework, so I know what I need to do on the API side. And then I can select an auth method. I could do simple, OAuth, JWT, or custom. Uh, because uh, there's actually two different modes of authentication for GitHub API and uh, the without any token at all, you can still make, what was it, 30 requests per minute or something like that, um, which is probably fine for some use cases. So I'm going to say custom and I'm going to make auth completely optional on this tab. Um, and oops, I, this already exists. So uh, I'm going to do this slightly differently. I'm going to run this one more time just to show you how easy it is. Uh, and this time I'm going to call it Git, GitHub 2 because I'm just that uh, creative. Uh, all right. So actually, can I increase my font size for, yeah, that might be easier for people to read. Uh, again, I'm going to accept all the defaults. Uh, REST API and custom or not NA auth. Okay, so now I should have a new folder um, for that tap. Um, I will show you what was created and then I'll jump you, I'll jump through the process that I went because I want to be uh, save a little bit of time at the end for questions or any other demos. Um, all right, so I'm going to go to my main source folder um, and within here I can see here's my Git, GitHub 2. Um, all right, so, so this is a project that, that has just been created for me, tap GitHub 2, and it creates for me these, uh, these five files, but really four of them have code in them. Um, I also um, have uh, a set of to-dos I can just trace through. Um, I use an extension called to-do tree, and it just shows me where any reference to the word to-do is. Actually, I'm in, <laughs> let's go to the right repo. Here we go. Um, so within the README, for instance, there are a bunch of developer to-dos about um, how to describe this to your, to your end user. Um, you can just go through them and update the, the, the README. 
Um, so I can just click through them to see what work I need to do after starting with this cookie cutter. Um, so for, but just to walk you through the, the, the files, um, there's an auth file. Um, in this case, because I don't really need auth, I'm gonna go ahead and just delete this file. Oh, whoops, I need to do that from here. So I'm deleting the auth file. Um, there's a client file, which will define how do I interact with the API itself. There's a streams file, which I'll use to define my streams. And there's a tap file, which I'll use to define my, inter my, um, my interface. So what's new in this version of the SD of the cookie cutter um, is that specifically we've broken this out into sm to, to more smaller files. So it's a little easier for you to manage your code base. Um, we also um, have fully implemented the client py file so you can literally just go through here fill out okay what should my url params be um, how do i manage my pagination token um, and you can see there's less than 100 lines of code here um, i ended up deleting this whole process because i didn't need to post process anything um, i for the github api you'll see it in a sec but i just basically uh, <laughs> know that my my answer is under the items um, uh, response so this is, this is great and good. Um, I'm not gonna walk you through all this just because of time, but it's really, um, it's pretty easy. There's, there's little snippets that explain what you should do in each section. Um, I do wanna show how I went about the, um, the development process for this and testing, because I think it might be helpful to many people. Um, there's a VS Code add-in that's very much like Postman that I discovered called Thunder Client. Um, and if you just add this into VS Code, um, you get something that looks a lot like Postman. Again, I'm not. This part is not advertising for Meltano or the SDK or anything. Just a cool tool that you might find valuable because you can do all of your API testing in place. So um, this is pulling up a, a, a test I did earlier. But I can do. Let's just take the base URL right here, or the base URL plus the path. Do a new request so I can show you what it looks like from scratch. Um, I paste in the URL endpoint and I just start running it and see what it does. Uh, so I immediately see that it's missing a Q argument. So I want to say Q is tap something. Let's let's be. I'm actually going to have a broader search, but let's just see tap because it's a callback. Um, MSSQ MSSQL. See if we can find. Um, yeah, here is the existing, and this is not. Ba this is. <laughs> based on Clojure and Java, and it's not natively uh, installable. It's, and this is the other tap MSQL that's broadly available and used. Um, and I can see that the API is working, right? So I'm hitting the API. All I did was paste in this. I just followed the error message to know that I needed to add a query parameter. And then if I were to go to the documentation for this API, I'll find out that there's a per page argument and there's a page argument. Um, so per page, let's say, let's just start with one and page one. So if this is working correctly, I should get exactly one result. And then if I go to page two, I should get my second result. So if you're like me and haven't done a lot with REST APIs, this is really nice um, to be able to explore, um, you know, explore the API before you have to write code against it. Because part of the hardest problem with writing a tap is actually not, especially now with the SDK, it's not really the code you have to write. It's understanding and dealing with the API itself. So this will help you debug the API natively in line um, with, with, uh, with your development process. So anyway, now I feel like I have a good understanding um, of how this works. I can do other tests, like specify this is 1,000 and try to go to the 10th page. Uh, I'll get an interesting error message, or I'll just get no items. And so this tells me, OK, well, how do I know when I'm at the, at the last page? Items should be empty. Um, so, so you can basically learn your API this way. So it's super, super convenient. Notice I haven't provided any auth, um, because the, the unauthenticated, um, uh, rate limit that GitHub provides, uh, is completely fine for my testing purposes. Um, I could go in here and add, uh, and I might get the exact thing wrong, but auth token, and then go get my personal GitHub auth token and paste it in here, but I'm just going to leave that off. All right, so so this is um, I'm, like I said, because of time, I'm not going to go through the the actual writing of the code. But you can see the process here is you basically um, just populate each item. 
Um, I'm going to switch over to the finished version real quick, <laughs> reminding uh, that Dow and I are meeting in a minute. Uh, all right, tap GitHub. So here's the here's the completed output. Um, in if I go to the client page, uh, you can see um, I did do an optional. If token auth token is provided, then I'll go ahead and pass it. If user agent is pa is um, provided, then I'll pass it. Um, and I I did do this next um, page token. If if there's anything in the items collection, as I showed you, then I'll return a token. Otherwise, I'm just going to return none. Um, so this is basically how you create a, a tap from scratch. Um, we have a lot of uh, really smart people thinking about how we can even make it easier, but it's already uh, getting pretty pretty easy and pretty straightforward to build your own tap. Um, all right. So the other thing I wanted to show is actually running it. So let's see if we can run it. Um, I have another terminal open on one of these windows that, hold on, mm, where'd it go? Um, so let's just, I thought I had that window open, uh, but let's just go here, tap GitHub, open integrated terminal. So I will say poetry run. This is a prefix. It's documented in the readme, but basically just runs it in your virtual environment. Tap uh, GitHub. I'm going to pass in a config file, which is config sample.json. And I just want to see uh, if this is, is running. Um, if you know, have you used Stinger before? This might look familiar. If not, this is going to look pretty foreign. But this is exactly what we want to see is that it's emitting record messages that are compliant with the singer spec. Um, within it, you can see that it's providing, um, you know, the ID for the repo, the name for the repo, um, a full name, which includes the owner. Uh, so we said essentially have a working tap here um, and it's generating these messages. Um, I also set up a Meltano project, which um, sends this same data uh, into a target JSONL file. Um, and the output of that is uh, here. So if you basically set up Meltano and you want to load it to your database, like uh, like um, like Derek mentioned, uh, you might be sending these as columns into a table in in, um, in Microsoft SQL Server. In my case, I just wanted them to dump locally as a JSONL file. Um, but tying this back now to the um, to the hub, um, this is. Uh, a, a the first step towards getting an auto discovered list of taps. Um, I've also provided languages Python uh, as a filter. Um, notice that the filter doesn't seem to actually uh, respect the the request to pull in this dash. So some of them don't have the dash, but the top results are pretty good. And with a little bit of cleanup, uh, cats walking on the keyboard. Excuse me. Uh, with a little bit of cleanup, uh, this this uh, will. You know, iterate towards being uh, an auto discovered list of all singer taps on, <laughs> on, on GitHub created using Meltano and Singer. So we're a little meta, meta project here. Um, any questions? This is pretty awesome. Do we have, um, I think we do, but, um, and this is, I'm going to be looking at later today, but mm -hmm. immediately as, as you're talking about, you know, making new taps and stuff, it's like, well, it should just be super easy to submit this to the hub. Mm -hmm. uh, as well, do we have we have issues around all that fun stuff, right? If not, I need to make them. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I. It's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if we have a specific issue on like write a process page for submitting to the hub. I think that we might we might want to create that. Uh, one thing I want to say as a as a pitch for um, for building using the SDK is that if you write with the SDK, you can do about format equals JSON. And here's a machine readable definition of your tap. It's automatically created by the SDK. It gives the name, version, the SDK version, the capabilities, um, and a list of the settings, uh, what type is expected for each of the supported settings. And so this can streamline the process of registering it in the hub because we're giving all this metadata and probably more metadata in the future that we'll add. Um, so you won't have to uh, guess or manually submit the list of um, manually submit the list of, of settings or, the, or that are um, available because it's uh, it's available there. That's awesome. And of course, I my had no idea you had the. 
what, what we're probably going to work towards, and this is related to what Taylor was describing earlier about how we have to find adjacent schema for these plugin tap and target definitions, is that the um, JSON schema that is output by this about flag on SDK built tabs matches, or at least is like a subset of what the hub supports. So that submitting a plugin to the hub will just be as easy as dumping this JSON dropping it into the repo and you're off to the races. And then we can even simplify it with a, uh, you know, SDK publish command or something where you never have to, you know, keep track of, of porting this definition structure to the other one. Uh, but there's a consistent understanding of how taps are defined. And as much of that information as possible should be contained in the tap itself, like the descriptions for various settings, the def default values, uh, instructions potentially about how to get an access token, et cetera, so that this can be um, formatted in a GEML for your, YAML or, or JSON format for the hub, rendered on the hub automatically. And we might even be able to automatically generate readme files for inside the tap and target repositories based on that same data so that uh, there are no, not these three, four different places where you have to keep the definitions up to date, but rather the tap itself becomes the single source of truth and everything else is populated based on that information. So uh, that is one of the things we'll be working on also over the coming uh, weeks and months. Great, awesome. Well, AJ, thank you. Thank you for the demo. Does anybody ha else, we have a few minutes left uh, on the clock here. Anybody have questions or anything else that they, they want to share that they've been working on? Got a few quiet people. Thanks for, for showing up. Blake, good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. No, this is awesome. I was just catching up on where things are at. So I'm, I'm pumped and seeing things going. Wonderful. Glad to have you here. Ed Edward, you mentioned you might have time to show off some improvements to tap Postgres you're working on. Uh, sure, yeah. Let me um, just at least give you a quick code uh, walkthrough of what I've done here. Uh, the issue that I faced was I was using the, uh, oh, sorry, this is the wrong one. Oh, no, this is the right one. Sorry. Okay, uh, let's see. Are we in the README here? You guys all see in my README? Uh, yes, but then, yeah. Somewhat. Um, let me show you the help that I wrote for it. Basically, what I have is a database that uh, has a strict limit that it'll cancel our queries after five minutes. And the tables are gigantic. And so the traditional incremental sync um, relies on sorting the table, and that was not feasible. And so I needed a tap that was going to go through and uh, pull by, by a timestamp column, uh, you know, some interval at a time. Um, and so what I did was uh, basically made a copy of the incremental replication strategy uh, Python file and modified it to be a time-based one. Let me go to my help that I wrote here. Uh, and so basically it takes the replication method time-based. Uh, the replication key mines a timestamp. I think this would work with any time field type, uh, but I haven't tested that yet. Um, and then a replication time interval in the format accepted by Postgres, um, like 10 minutes. Uh, so here's an example of configuring this new replication method. This is my actual configuration. The column name is time. Um, and what this does, a uh, few bits that I'll show you that I thought were interesting. Uh, here's the code. Um, I found this, this code was in here, but not used. Fetch max replication key. I don't know why that's there. Uh, but it was easy to change to make a fetch min replication key. So one cool feature is that when you start it, it actually finds out what is the earliest time in that field um, and starts uh, syncing from there. Um, here you can see the logic of computing a next replication key. It basically takes the, the, the last timestamp that it received, uh, casts it as a timestamp because here it's as a string and then um, adds that interval and just gets back that answer and then uses that in its next query. Um, trying to think of where are the interesting bits to show you here. Something uh, different about this uh, replication strategy than the other one is it's actually repeating queries, whereas the other one just opens up one cursor and sits there and iterates through the cursor indefinitely. Uh, this one's actually, you know, that was basically the requirement I was trying to meet was, was do the same kind of syncing by issuing a lot of small queries instead of a giant one that was gonna stay open for so long. And is the, um, the interval setting um, set right at minutes or can you specify like hours or? It's anything that Postgres will accept, which is okay. 
A anything you can do years, days, months, anything uh, that Postgres will take. Um, That's great. And yeah. then I presume your the more regular state messages will be output because of this strategy. You're using smaller. Um, the state message em emission, I didn't change it. I think that's right here is the, I think that's this uh, is if the number of rows, you know, modulo the bookmark period equals zero, then it emits the state message. So it doesn't actually emit it after every query. Uh, I didn't change the logic of when the state message would come out. Yeah, yeah this is cool. I had a question, Edward. Did, did you yeah. consider uh, just as an alternative solution to the problem you were seeing with the curses expiring? catching that's rescuing from that exception and then just reissuing a new query based on the, I guess, latest value that was loaded successfully in the last run. Uh, because I'm wondering if the pipeline-wise folks would be inclined to accept a totally new replication method that I think is um, your invention. And it's a cool one, but it's not kind of standard in the Singer ecosystem yet. I wonder no. if a, the solution of rescuing from the expiration would be more scalable across different tabs. The, the problem is I don't ever get one record back because it can't sort the table in time. Oh, it can't sort the table in time. Right. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, this is I think this is a really cool solution though. Yeah, it's almost like you're creating your own pagination. Like, like give me limit the records, like paginate by, uh, but like over a database, which doesn't normally do pagination the same way. Yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting, interesting too, because where this lives, you can make different arguments for what is controlling this logic. Like, the, should the, you know, what what Meltano could. Um, like the, the tap could just be kind of generally unaware of having any sort of increment and then just accept like a, a window. And then like Meltano or another tool is handling that logic. So like we did this with Airflow uh, on the, the GitLab side, um, but you know, maybe baked into the, the target a little bit more makes sense. Um, it's interesting. We need to come up with better patterns, I think for this across the board. This, yeah, this, this, this could be, I thought about it, but I just wanted to get my important job, you know, what I'm working oh, yeah, yeah. on done. It should be generalized out to be a, anything that is a range, yeah. you know, just that it could accept, because it could just be an integer where you say, I want to sync this table 10,000 integers at a time. Um, I feel like you could generalize this code to handle both, mm -hmm. but what, literally anything, you know, mm. Uh, but it works for uh, it works for timestamps, and it's I. Uh, this just took me a day, and uh, it's syncing record records right now. Cool. Good stuff. Awesome. Well, yeah. thank you for for sharing that, Edward. Um, cool. Well, we are a little bit past time, so uh, we'll go ahead and end it there. Thank you, everybody who who shared. Um, come find us on Slack. We'll have uh, office hours next week on Wednesday, and then two weeks from today, we'll have.